There's a verse in Jeremiah which reminds me of this verse we read from John's Gospel. God so loved the world. Um, that's a, a, a wonderful and well-known aspect of the Gospel, isn't it? But there's a verse in Jeremiah that I think makes it more personal. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I thought this morning, we'll, we'll take a little time to think about that verse. Three things. I. Who's the I? Yeah. In that verse. And then you. And then everlasting love. The I in this verse, I have loved you with an everlasting love, is God. Mm. God, the creator and maker of us all. God, who loves us. Now, you would think, perhaps, that God, in his capacity as judge, might be rather annoyed with the human race. But God is pictured as a father. And you can well imagine a father being annoyed with the bad behaviour of his children, and yet still loving them. And the Bible tells us that although we have sinned, turned our backs on God and gone our own way, yet he loves us. In fact, you remember the story, we read it uh, one Sunday recently, and Dave was speaking about it, the prodigal son. He turned his back on his father and he left, and he lived a life of, well, riotous living is how the Bible puts it. He partied with his dad's money and he ended up making a fool of himself and he wanted to return home. The whole point of that story, friends, apart from the way it shows how we all have got it wrong, we are the prodigal son, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the point of the story is God's love welcoming him back again. Just happy that he was home. Just happy to have him back. God is the I in this verse. And friends, no matter how far we've strayed from God in our lives, he's happy to welcome us home. And through Jesus, God has given us a message which is a, a message of welcome. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It shows us the way home. It's like a, a sign pointing. Which way to the church would be a nice sign. But which way to God is a better sign? Because Jesus is the one who brings us back to God. He died on the cross, taking our place, taking the punishment for the sin that we deserve, that we might go free, that we might be cleansed of sin and welcomed in the Father's house. Now don't, don't misunderstand, of course, when the prodigal son came home, he was, he was dressed in rags, and he might have smelled a bit. Do you know why? He'd been working looking after pigs on the farm. That pond. But the, the cleaning up came later. The welcome home came first. God's love doesn't depend on us cleaning ourselves up or getting it right. God's love for us is just love. He takes us as we are, but you know, he is the one who will clean us up. Because the, the son came home, he got clean, they put new clean clothes on him, and they said, look, my son was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost and is found. You and I are like the son, we are lost in our sin, but when we come to Jesus believing that he is the son of God who died for us and who rose again, we have found the way home. Jesus hanging on the cross might sound like a strange sign post but it's the only signpost we need. You want to know the way home to God? Look to the cross where Jesus died for you, and he died for me. The I who has loved you is God. What about you, the you? Well, in John 3.16 we read, God so loved the world, and that includes everyone. It's strange to say there are parts of the world where people have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God loves them. Mm. There are parts of the world, large parts of the world, where there are other religions which paint God in a very bad light and blaspheme his son, Jesus Christ. Mm. What of these people? God loves them. There are those who high-handedly break God's laws, who spit in the face of God, curse him, use the name of Jesus only as a swear word, 
What about those people? God loves them. God so loved the world that he gave his son. But then this verse, I have loved you, I think is more personal. It reminds mm. us that God's love for you is an individual love. We are not here by accident. Our lives sometimes seem a, a mess of mistakes. But God didn't make a mistake when he made you and me. And he loves you and me the way we are. Oh, he needs to clean us up for sure inside our hearts. But he loves us all the same. You are someone God loves. That's the you. You are someone God made. That you might have a relationship with himself. That's who you are. You are the masterpiece of the artist of heaven. And God has found a way to restore the masterpiece. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not to put us on the wall, but to display us as part of his forever family. God loves you and me. I know one thing else I can say about you and me. You're a sinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a sinner. All have sinned, the Bible says. That includes you and me. So it's a pattern here. Everyone has sinned and everyone is loved. Which brings us to Jesus dying for everyone. Jesus rising again that everyone might believe and be saved. That's why Jesus told his apostles to go into all the world, tell the whole of creation the good news that uh, through him their sins can be forgiven. It's a message for the whole world. But it's a personal message for you and me. You know, when I was a boy, I remember being in school and our vicar would come to see us. Half the time he was sober, and uh, <laughs> the other half the time <laughs> he, was he was a bit pickled. He had a job to get up in assembly. But I loved the old fella, Ralph his name was, Ralph Bowden up in Trevethy, wonderful man. And he would come to assembly and he'd tell us a story from the Bible and uh, sometimes fumble his words. He'd tell us about God. And at Easter we'd learn about Jesus dying and rising again. And I can't say I ever didn't particularly believe it. I wasn't against it. But I remember thinking as a young boy, well what's it got to do with me? Wonderful story. But why are you telling me that? Why are you telling me that Jesus died? Why are you telling me that he rose again? I don't get what it's got to do with me. And I thought, you know, used to go along to the old church and it was drafty. And uh, if you didn't know otherwise, you think, well, this religion is dull and boring. I don't have anything to do with that. But it was because our vicar never really explained what it had to do with me. He loved you. He died for you. He took your sin. Now there's something you need to do. You need to give your life to him. You need to give your life to Jesus. Put your faith in him. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart and life. And you will be, become one of his children and one of his followers. That's the you. You, I have loved you. You could be transformed by that love. No longer like the prodigal son away from God. But back home, a son of God, a child of the king because God says I have loved you with an everlasting love and I love that last part of this uh, Bible verse God's love has no beginning and no end that's what everlasting means and we find that hard to understand don't we when we see God's love has no beginning and no end we'll understand then why it can't be broken God is love the Bible says and it's impossible for God not to love you and not to love me. Oh, I know the Bible says about the last day of judgment. Souls that go to heaven and souls that go to hell. Yes, we can read all about that. But you know, no one ever went to hell because God didn't love them. Sadly, if anyone ever ends up there, it's because they rejected the love God did have. The door was wide open, the lights were on, and the father was welcoming, and a lot of his children said, no, no. His love is everlasting. God would rather take human flesh on himself and die an awful death at the hands of wicked men than let you perish. And that's exactly what he did. The everlasting love of God is shown most clearly, according to the Bible, at the cross. When Jesus dies, the Bible says, that, well, 
There aren't many that would die for a righteous man, although possibly some might die for a good man. But think of God's love. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God has demonstrated his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we are forgiven, before we accept Jesus as Saviour, before we become children of God, he loves us with that love of, the, of Calvary at the cross. Loves us enough to die for us. I think it's wonderful, friends. And then, having saved us, having brought us into relationship with himself, he reminds us that that love can never die. That love can never be broken. Oh, you've had friends let you down, haven't you? You've had family let you down, haven't you? I know you have, because everyone has. It's, that's human nature. But it's not God's nature. It's not God's nature to let us down. His word is always true, and we can be certain of it. How do I know that Jesus lives? He lives within my heart. It's an experience that you have. I gave my heart to Jesus. I was quite young. I was still, just a week before my 18th birthday, I gave my heart to Jesus. I realized I was a sinner needing salvation. And I asked the pastor at the time, who's long since gone, mm -hmm. asked him if he would pray with me and help me to ask Jesus into my heart, which uh, I did. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And the reason I say God's word is reliable is because I did believe in my heart that Jesus rose from the dead. I did confess him as my Lord with my mouth, and I am saved. Mm -hmm. It worked. When I asked Jesus for his forgiveness, he saved me. What shall I say to close today? I have loved you with an everlasting love. It was St. Paul the Apostle who said on one occasion, when he wrote it down, he said, then, I live my life by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, at the end of the service this morning, we take the communion, and you're welcome to take part in communion this morning. And as we take the bread, which stands for Jesus' body broken on the cross, and the wine, which stands for his blood shed for us. Think again about that love being personal. When I was a lad and I wasn't a Christian yet, there was a chap who used to sit at the back here, um, Tony. Was it Tony? Tony Fowler. Tony Fowler. And I was sat at the back and he said to me, do you know what he said? If you were the only person in the world, Jesus still would have died for you. Yeah. And I thought about that, and I think about it now and then. His love is personal. There is a relationship God wants to have with each and every one of us. And at the communion table, we remember how we are welcome. Those old songs that say, come to the Saviour, come to the cross, and kneel there and hand your life over to the one who loved you and gave himself for you. And I'm going to ask Barbara and Shemaine if they'll come and sing for us again before we uh, take part in that communion.